So far in subtopic 5.1 we've been looking at electrostatics. We're now going to have a look at what happens when charges start to move. You can see here the title is about electric currents, so that's dealing with moving charges through conductors. So the first thing we need to identify though is what's going to happen if um, an electric field is established in a region where there are lots of charges. So this will lead us into the idea of electric currents, uh, but um, we need to first of all look at a more general scenario uh, where, as I say, um, an electric field is established in a region uh, containing charges. And when that happens, um, as we've already seen, an electric field acting on a charge is going to uh, exert a force on it. So these charges experience a force. and that force um, can cause them to move. Won't necessarily always cause them to move, uh, depending on the, the scenario, um, but uh, the force can cause charges to move. Uh, and to sort of explain both of those um, things that I just mentioned there about whether or not they move, uh, let's look at the, an example um, of a conductor. So in a conductor, we have um, uh, both scenarios occurring. So if we imagine that we've got a conductor here, um, and in that conductor, we're going to have some fixed positive charges. So the fixed positive charges aren't going to move because they're contained within the, the metal lattice. So these little pluses here are representing the fixed positive charges. So um, this isn't always going to be the case, we're only dealing with uh, this case being a conductor. So these fixed positive charges are basically the uh, protons in the nucleus, so they are the atomic nuclei. And around those um, uh, fixed positive charges, we're going to have some free electrons that are able to move throughout that lattice and those free electrons or those um, negative charges are, um, so we'll call those mobile negative charges and as I said they're uh, free electrons or otherwise known as valence electrons. So they're the um, uh, outer shell electrons that are quite easily able to uh, move through the metal lattice and in this scenario we're going to set up an electric field and that electric field is going to be directed towards the right. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about how that electric field is established, we're just going to talk about it being there. Uh, that's uh, sort of the, the focus of a, another video. Uh, so that electric field directed towards the right and we know that the uh, electric field represents the force that would act on a small positive test charge. Now these small positive charges here that we have in the nuclei, they're not going to move. Instead the negative charges are going to move, but because they're negatives, they're going to move in the opposite direction to the electric field. So all of these negative charges are then going to start to move in this direction. So there's an example of how an electric field can cause the charges in a region to move. Now that particular property is known as electrical conduction. So if something can conduct uh, electricity, if something can cause charges to move, uh, it's known as electrical conduction. And obviously uh, conductors are a good example of that. Um, however, uh, this uh, can also happen um, in uh, liquids and gases. And in that situation, um, the reason why it can occur in liquids and gases is that um, uh, there are oftentimes mobile charge carriers that are present. And when we're talking mobile charge carriers, we don't necessarily just mean electrons. In the case of uh, liquids and gases, those mobile charge carriers could be things like ions, so atoms that have either lost or gained electrons, so they'll have charge on them. Uh, it could also be polar molecules, so molecules where the charge is not evenly distributed through it, 
uh, but where say one end of the molecule is slightly more positive and the other end is slightly more negative. So those uh, ends of the molecules are going to be affected by that electric field. Now if we are uh, to continue to have that charge to flow, so if charge continually flows through a uh, substance, and we'll focus more specifically on conductors now, um, that's known as an electric current. We can have this same idea occurring with uh, liquids and gases again, uh, but uh, as I said, um, we'll focus more specifically on conductors because that's where we see it more frequently. So this is known as uh, electric current. And in that situation, we're looking just at the flow of charge through a, uh, a conductor. The equation to calculate current is I is equal to delta Q on delta T. So that's the equation that's in the data booklet. Um, and I'm starting with that just as a, a way to um, identify how to calculate it, but also to identify what these quantities are. So I is the electric current. And hopefully you can remember that electric current is measured in amperes, uh, where amperes are an SI unit. Uh, delta Q is the total charge passing uh, a point or flowing past a particular point in the conductor. And given that it is charge, uh, the units will be uh, coulombs. And the quantity delta T is then just the, uh, the time taken for that charge, so for delta Q, uh, to flow past the point. Measured in seconds. Now, while it might seem like um, electric currents move very quickly, uh, and by that I mean um, uh, that uh, as soon as you turn a light on, uh, the light bulb immediately turns on as well. So you might think that current then flows immediately from the switch to the, uh, to the light. Um, current is actually quite slow, um, and that means that the speed of electrons is actually quite slow in a current. So what we're going to look at here is a concept known as electron drift speed. We're going to deal a little bit more generally than looking at electrons and just deal with charge um, of any nature. Uh, and to do that we're going to consider a length of a conductor, so ultimately we are talking about electrons, um, but we don't want to limit ourselves to uh, the case of just electrons. We want to be able to deal with any type of charge moving through any substance. Um, so we're going to consider a conductor with a cross-sectional area of A and a few other quantities that we need to identify here as well. Um, and the charge carriers are going to have charge Q on them. So each individual charge has the charge Q. We also have a quantity known as charge carrier density and so that relates to the number of charge carriers, so not the total charge itself but the number of charge carriers uh, in a given volume, so per cubic metre. So that uh, idea there, N charge carriers per cubic metre, is known as the charge carrier density. So to look at that uh, in a diagram, here's our length of a conductor. And we're going to be interested in uh, this particular point here. And at that particular point, we're going to see that the current flowing through it is given by that equation that we saw earlier, delta Q on delta T. Now, if you think about that situation, if we imagine the quantity delta Q, that means that we could track back a certain distance in the conductor. So a length L 
and in that uh, distance, that would be the distance that contains all of the charge delta Q that flows past this point in time delta T. So that uh, entirety of space will, will incorporate all of the charge delta Q. So that means that we can calculate the charge delta Q considering we know what the density of the charge carriers is, being n, and if we multiply that by the volume and then multiply the total number of charge carriers in that volume by the charge on each carrier. However, the volume we can calculate by considering it's the cross-sectional area multiplied by that length L. So V is actually equal to A times L. So the total charge delta Q is then given by uh, N A L multiplied by Q. So we can substitute that into our equation for the current. So we can say that I is now equal to N A L multiplied by Q over delta T. We're going to take this one step further though by identifying that this quantity here, the length L, divided by the time taken delta T, corresponds to the uh, quantity of speed. We can notate there that L over delta T is equal to a speed V. So we have that final equation that I is equal to N A V multiplied by Q. So that equation is the one that's in the data booklet. So it's looking at the drift speed of a charge carrier uh, relating to the flow of current itself. So the quantities that we need to be aware of there, we've already seen that I is the electric current, and that's measured in amps. N is the charge carrier density and given that it's the number of charge carriers in a particular volume, the units there are just per cubic meter. A is the cross-sectional area of the conductor, as we mentioned previously, and cross-sectional area uh, will be measured in square meters. Uh, v is the drift speed of the charge carriers. Uh, if we're talking about um, current through a conductor, we'd usually refer there to uh, the electron drift speed, um, but more generally it's just the drift speed. Uh, and finally Q is the charge on each charge carrier. And again, if we're talking about electrons, uh, that would just be uh, the charge on an electron. And that would be measured in coulombs. Now to give you a bit of context here, uh, as an example, the electron drift speed in a copper wire, where that copper wire has a diameter of 0.65 millimetres and it's carrying a current of 0.25 amps, uh, the drift speed of the electrons in that case would be 0.055 millimetres per second. So the electrons aren't really moving that quickly at all, it's simply that there's so much charge in the piece of copper wire that the electrons moving through will allow that current of 0.25 amps while the speed of the electrons themselves is quite slow. The reason why a light then turns on so quickly is purely because there's so much charge for the entire circuit that when you turn on the switch, all of that charge starts to move uh, together so energy is transferred to the light very quickly.